Hi, everybody. I'm Ralph Benmergi. Welcome to Not That Kind of Rabbi. It seems like quite a while since I've done a Not That Kind of Rabbi. I've been a little on the busy side. Uh, I do have some other podcasts that I've been doing. I have one for Jazz FM that I do once a month called The Torch. We've had some fabulous guests and they pass on their wisdom from the years they've spent in the jazz world. Uh, I also have one for the Canadian Jewish News, the cjn.ca slash podcast, and you'll find Yehupitzville. And that's my conversation with Jews living in far-flung areas of uh, Canada and the world. I did one with someone from Girona, Spain a little while ago, but I've also just done one with somebody who's trying to form an Orthodox community in the beach town of Innisfil near Barrie and Lake Simcoe, Ontario. So interesting stuff there. Um, by the way, if you want to know anything about what I'm doing, just go to ralphbenmergi.ca. Uh, and you can also, uh, if you're interested, uh, get my book there. It's called I Thought He Was Dead, A Spiritual Memoir. Wow, what a time. <sighs> Working on in politics these days uh, as a uh, strategic communicator and an issues and policy kind of guy uh, working for the Green Party in Ontario, as a matter of fact, uh, who are dear to my heart, wonderful people and uh, well worth my time. But that hasn't left me much time to think about what's coming up and what's coming up in uh, this particular moment, if you happen to be hearing it in the next day or so or week or so is um, Passover. Um, you know, I've always found it interesting when you don't live as the dominant culture in a society, when your holidays come up, they're sort of your own little thing. And even when uh, most of my life hadn't been spent in Toronto, lots of Jewish people in Toronto, but right now I live in Hamilton where there's 5,000 Jewish people, 5,000 Jewish souls, roughly. Um, so it's more of your own little thing. Um, I'm always reminded of when I was shooting a documentary called My Israel, um, and we arrived uh, for shooting in Israel on Christmas Eve, and we went to Bethlehem, and people were singing jingle bells in Arabic. And then the next morning, I was in Herzliya, north of Tel Aviv, to shoot an interview with an entrepreneur there. And I'm outside, and we're shooting the exterior of the building so that we can establish for people where we are in the documentary. And I'm looking around, I'm thinking, this is really weird. Why do I feel so weird? And then I realized that for the first time in my life, I was in a place where there was no Christmas. There were no Christmas lights, no Christmas trees, no Christmas sales, no buzz. It was just another day. And I realized then that, of course, the dominant culture in Israel wouldn't be about Christmas unless you happen to be Russian, and then it would be Sylvester, as they call it, and a whole different experience with New Year's and Christmas. But it really struck me that I've spent my whole life, you know, if you're Jewish uh, on Yom Kippur, if you're walking to a synagogue, because you're not uh, really supposed to be driving on that day, if you're walking to a synagogue, the whole rest of the world is just Move it along. Stores are open. People are driving. Everybody's walking. And there you are. Little Jewish moment going to synagogue. Passover sometimes feels like that. But it's certainly, I've always told my non-Jewish friends that it's kind of our version of Christmas because it's when you have to sit with your family. It's a really good idea that we all get together, uh, whether we're getting along or not, and just uh, share some food and have uh in our case, two nights of Passover, uh, because if you didn't live in uh, the promised land, then you weren't positive if it was one night or the other, so you didn't take a chance, you did it twice. If you live in Israel, you do it once. And the Seder is something I want to talk to my guest about. But I, I also wanted to just frame the idea of what matters to me. Now, many of you may have watched The Ten Commandments, Okay, the Cecil B. DeMille overwrought operatic Ten Commandments, which really, there is much about a fictitious romance love story uh, as anything else. But when you think of that, you think of Pharaoh is Yul Brenner and Moses is Charlton Heston. Um, 
Martin Short, who is one of the funniest humans alive. I interviewed him a, a long time ago about something on radio. And I said, how was the flight up to Toronto? Uh, and he, he said, I was sitting in a plane and three rows behind me was Charlton Heston. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, Moses is on the plane. Do not look back. Do not look back. And finally, I couldn't resist anymore. I mean, Moses was on my plane. So I slowly kind of nonchalantly turned around as if I was just looking down to see where the bathroom might be or something. Uh, and uh, uh, Charlton Heston was you know, viciously picking his nose. I mean, really going at it, he says, and he could not stop laughing. It was just wonderful. Um, but that's what we get. We get this Hollywood version of, of something that was supposed to be our Exodus story, which is one of the key stories in, in Torah. Um, I'm going to talk to somebody now about the way I see the story, the way they see the story. Uh, and I'm sure their thoughts will be much more profound than mine. So I want to introduce you to my guest. He is the rabbi of Makom, the downtown Jewish uh, synagogue and uh, creative center, I might add. And his name is Rabbi Aaron Levy, and he joins me now. Mr. Levy, Rabbi Levy, how are you, sir? Oh, I think you're muted. No, I'm not. Oh, well. <laughs> we, nice should have a we should have a T-shirt that just says, um, unmute yourself. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Like two years into this thing. So. Yeah, exactly. We've almost got it down. Um, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Yourself? Good, good. Uh, one of my sons goes to your synagogue every once in a while, and it, it just made me realize that you and I have never really had a good conversation. We've met a very long time ago, but that's about it. And I thought we should talk about what Passover means to you and what it is you try to communicate to people about that meaning. So I say Passover or Pesach, and you say... Freedom. Uh, tell me more. So I think Pesach is really our people's celebration, first and foremost, of freedom, but freedom really on multiple levels, not just in the sense of literal physical freedom from slavery, but also the idea of freedom to become a people, uh, not just to be individuals, but to actually have a sense of community. And you really, I think in the, the Torah's narrative, you really start seeing the Israelites as a people with their, their enslavement and then Exodus, their liberation from Egypt. Um, so I think there's that communal aspect to it as well. Um, I think there's also the idea of economic freedom, which of course ties into slavery as well, because slaves do not have economic freedom. But uh, in a number of different sources in the Torah and in the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible more generally, um, you have words uh, like dror, which means liberty or freedom, that are used um, in, in all kinds of contexts having to do with someone's economic autonomy. Um, and ability to provide for themselves and to live in a society that makes that possible uh, and where they're not economically oppressed. Uh, so there's there's that type of freedom. Um, there's, of course, freedom of thought, freedom of speech, religion, conscious, conscience. Um, those are, I think, important freedoms too. And I think a lot of these different understandings of freedom kind of come together in what we do at the seder, at the, the ritualized meals that we have on the first two nights of Pesach, Passover in the diaspora, and as you said, only the first night in the land of Israel. Um, and uh, I'll mention there's an irony to this because the whole seder is a very detailed structure. In fact, the word seder means order. It's, it's like, you know, a 15 step organized meal with different food, symbols that we that we eat and that we say blessings on along the way and different prescribed passages we're supposed to read and think about and stuff like that so if anything you could say the structure of the seder seems inherently to be very confining right um but i think the uh the idea is that it is creating kind of a vessel for us to inhabit 
uh, in which to then have the freedom to think about the bigger themes that are going on. Um, and uh, I think- I'm going to stop you there for a second. Yeah. Because to me, this is one of the most interesting things about the Exodus story uh, to me. The continual failure of the people involved in the story to really accept their freedom. I mean, I, I, I keep thinking of even Behalohecha, I mean, even that, that, that part of Torah where you've got these people who just cannot stop whining. And manna that's, you know, just there for them in the middle of a place where there should be nothing is not enough. And it's like, hey, man, I want a burger. And at this point, the story turns to, oh, not good enough. I, okay, tell you what, I'll give you meat, not for like five days or 15 days or 20 days. I'll give you so much meat that you have to eat it for a month till it's coming out of your nostrils. And then the people who, the quail arrive and the people who eat it die uh, because of their excess. And, and what, what is it they say when they say they want meat? In Egypt, in slavery, we got three squares a day and we got meat. You're asking us to come out here where we don't know where we're going because freedom is more open-ended, not as structured, right? So to me, I'm always amazed by how poorly the people come up with their solutions to being free, that they're actually happier being enslaved. Well, at least in hindsight, they are, or not really in hindsight, but rather kind of nostalgically they are when when facing the uncertainty and the difficulties that are part and parcel of being in the Sinai desert uh, for a long period of time, for 40 years. And so, uh, you know, I don't think that if you were to ask the Israelites when they were still enslaved in Egypt, how's this working out for you? That they'd say, oh, it's great, you know, <laughs> at least we've got food, right? Uh, I think it's it's really only when they're in a very different set of circumstances that, you know, with with rose colored glasses, uh, being back in Egypt looks pretty good. But I think that, that this also kind of gets to the tension between structure and spontaneity that is very much a tension within Passover and, and within the Seder in particular, and more generally within Judaism, right? Uh, like at least from a traditional perspective, we have three set prayer services a day that one can do either with a community or individually, but from a traditional perspective, you're supposed to do these every day. And the purpose of these is not just to go through the words, but is to actually try to have a spiritual experience where you feel connected to God, right? Um, that's not the kind of thing though, that you can just program and, and say, this is definitely gonna happen. But at least a traditional Jewish approach is to say that, well, you, you pray, three times a day, every day, and hopefully some of those times with proper pep preparation and intention, you'll actually achieve something more spiritual from it, right? But if you say, oh, I'm only going to pray when I'm feeling so inspired, you're probably never gonna get around to it. And then you'll have no spiritual experiences, right? So to create the structure first and then um, give space for the intention and the, the feeling to emerge from within that structure, think is, is an overall kind of approach that we see in Judaism and that certainly plays out in Passover and in the Seder. You know, I, I often have said that it, uh, spirituality is a relationship issue to yourself, to the other, to the universe, um, uh, but that religion is an attempt to form community and have a fitness program. Right. Because if it's there, like you said, if, if you leave yourself open to the opportunity space, you may find yourself encountering something. On the other hand, somebody like Heschel would say, um, you know, prayer in the modern age is where uh, uh, God goes to die because the people just don't resonate. They just do it because they know it. Right. But I, 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 when I think about slavery, I, I, I often think of Passover as a personal thing, that Pharaoh is not an external, that we all have a Pharaoh that is beating us up from inside. 
And when I think of the kind of extractive um, society we live in today, I think there is so much enslavement in it. I mean, a $14 minimum wage is a poverty wage. 40 hours a week, does you can't afford to live. So that is enslavement. And, and then we find ourselves, you know, the pandemic kind of woke everybody up to how, what kind of enslavements they were involved in, you know, commuting five days a week for two and a half hours a, a day when you could have done your work from home in, in some cases, things like that. But I don't know if we really, we want to say we want to be free, but I, I'm just, I keep getting out of the story that we're just not really that good at it. Not even in hindsight, we're just not that good at it because it requires a ton of responsibility to be done well, right? Yeah, freedom is challenging. And what, um, some of what you were saying a minute ago reminds me that there is a trend within a number of uh, Hasidic commentaries on the holiday of Pesach. Um, that Mitzrayim, the, the Hebrew word for Egypt that's used over and over again in the Torah, should be revocalized as Meitzarim, the narrow places. Um, and that it's sort of a, a Hasidic, a early modern Jewish mystical populist kind of spiritual revivalist group that still exists to this day in, in multiple sects. Um, there's an attempt to kind of take the external narrative of Passover and the Exodus and to internalize it, to psychologize it, to make it something that everybody can experience themselves on a personal level. Um, and to say that that through the experience of celebrating Passover, we're trying to free ourselves from our own Meitzarim, from our own narrow places um, in order to achieve greater expansiveness. Um, and uh, like it says in the Psalms, um, from the narrow places I called to God, um, answer me uh, with uh, expansiveness, God. So, so my, favorite, kind of my favorite question for every rabbi is, uh, when you say God, what do you mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> just a small topic. <laughs> Um, the, I think the, the most succinct formulation uh, of what God means that really resonates with me that I find in Judaism, or in general, because I, <laughs> I find it in Judaism, um, is a line from Elima Rabati, which is a text by the uh, Jewish mystic Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, who lived in the 16th century. And he writes, Ha'eloa kol nimtza, that God is all that exists. And so it's it's a, what we would now call a panentheistic approach to theology. The idea that all that exists is part of God, and yet God is also beyond everything. So it's it's not just pantheism. It's not just saying that everything physical comprises God. Um, and certainly it's not saying that each individual force of nature or um, or object is a God unto itself, um, but it's saying that that everything is a manifestation of God, uh, but God is also beyond this world. So God is both imminent and, and not just suffuses our experiences and, and everything that, that there is in the universe, but actually is all of this. And at the same time, God is transcendent. God is also beyond that. So, you know, it's a, it's a paradox, but that's the, that's the tension that a lot of Jewish mysticism is really grappling with. And so I think Rabbi Moshe Cordovero's formulation of that is a nice, concise way of expressing that. So uh, I'm re rereading Jay Michelson's book, Everything is God, and, uh, mm -hmm. non-dualism, you know, just the idea that what you're, what you're talking about. But then I wonder when, you, when you're talking on a Saturday and you're talking to your congregation and the word God, which has now for many people emptied out because it has been presented for so long as a patriarchal um, Saint, you know, King James Bible kind of vibe of the Lord, the King of the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people just click. It's like, sorry, I, I can't, this is, doesn't make any sense. God said this and God said that. <clears throat> and yet 
to try to make sense of these stories of the Exodus and, and of Passover is a time when we have a, a central figure in Moses who's supposed to be having an ongoing conversation with God. And God is literally telling Moses what to do or guiding Moses to do what he should be doing. So how do you reconcile what you just said about what, what God is and what you then find yourself on a Saturday morning talking about with people? Well, I would say that the Torah and many Jewish sources speak in an idiom that personalizes God, right? Um, and even personifies God. Um, and that has its pros to it. It makes God feel much more comprehensible and approachable and there for you, right? It's much less abstract as a concept. Um, it, but on the other side, on the other hand, it, it, I think, you know, at some level is a, a further from perfect expression of, of God's nature. Um, what do you mean? And, I mean, I don't think anything can be a perfect expression of God's nature because God is inherently be ineffable beyond expression. Um, so even, even the, you know, the, the phrase from Rabbi Moshe Cordovero that I was saying really resonates with me is, is still just like an imperfect approximation probably. But all the more so statements about God where, you know, God has a mighty hand and an outstretched arm to redeem the Israelites from Egypt, right? Um, that kind of anthropomorphism uh, is useful because it's something that we can relate to, it's more concrete, but it also has its pitfalls. So, so what are the pitfalls to that? I think, well, there are many. I mean, on the most gross level, just like imagining God as like a big person in the sky or something. Yeah, Santa um, God. I'm sorry? Santa God. Yeah. A, a guy on the throne with a white beard and a naughty and nice list, right? Right. And uh, so that's, that's one pitfall that I think can really mislead a lot of Jews, a lot of people in the world in terms of how they conceive of God. And I think also that conception of God not only leads to people having a misconception and therefore perhaps a, an understanding and a relationship with God that is based on sort of false premises, but also then leads lots of people to rebel from spirituality um, and particularly from theistic spirituality, because they think like, oh, well, if that's what God is, I don't want anything to do with that. Right. But, you know, that's like saying, I, I don't know, reject math because all it says is like one plus one equals two or something, right? Because that's what I learned in kindergarten or something, right? But if you, if you never get to more mature, nuanced understandings of things, um, then of course it's going to seem very simplistic and juvenile. Um, it's a tough one. I struggle with it because they're, you know, we teach kids these things and they just, when they hit adolescence, they just think, what are you talking about? You know, magic and mystery and miracles and what, you know, that's not the way the world, well, you're selling me, we live in a rational age. You want, you know, show me, you know, it's like the old uh, prove God, you know, and then the rhetorical answer, prove love, right. And all that stuff. So I think it's still difficult because it's interesting. The um, I'm trying to think of what people will feel when they're reading their Seder and what they'll, you know, do. for me, it's just remembering as a Sephardic Moroccan, how you do it. You know, my mother always used to say, I'd say, why are we doing this? And she'd go, what do you mean, why? Who cares why? Just get it right or we'll forget who we are. And that would be it, right? And then I'd go to an Ashkenazi uh, Passover Seder, and it would be, why? Why are we doing this? And I'd think, oh, wow, we never did this at home. <laughs> we never actually talked about why we were doing it. We just, you know, the point was to do it. But how? where does a person aim if they're in that moment and they're reading that Seder and uh, that Haggadah, that book of, of, of the Seder? Where, where, do they, where do you aim when you're there? What are you connecting to? Yeah, good question. Um, so by the way, just to translate another term literally, right? We talked about seder means order. So Haggadah literally means the telling, right? It's it's the book of the story. 
Um, it's not a book of laws. Um, right. So, I mean, there are lots of laws about Passover in general and the satyrs in particular. And as someone who's traditionally observant, those are very important to me. Uh, and I certainly strive to my utmost to follow them. Um, but I think it's important to note that like the Haggadah is it's about reenacting the story of Passover. It's supposed to be a dramatic kind of replay of it um, through different symbolic foods and storytelling and even physical postures like leaning when we drink the cups of wine, eat the matzah, um, which, you know, is, is supposed to remind us of freedom and leisure and also has to do with the historical context in which the ancient rabbis from about 2000 years ago created the Seder uh, really in the the wake of the destruction of the second temple in 70 CE by the Romans. And so the, the main ritual of temple times of eating the Passover sacrifice, the Korban Pesach was no longer an option. So that was the, the, you know, key aspect of, of celebrating Pesach. So what to do? So the rabbis of late antiquity reformulated it, um, into what we now have as the seder. And of course it evolved further over time, but the basic structure of it is already concretized by the, the compilation of the Mishnah, first major book of rabbinic Jewish law in 200 CE. Um, and it's, it's very similar to what we have in like seders nowadays. Anyway, um, so where was I going with all this? Sorry. Well, um, so the, the, what, but, where um, do you aim when you're yeah, doing Yeah, so thank you. I remembered. Um, so <laughs> the rabbis, modeled this new dinner structure, not after the Passover sacrifice, the Korban Pesach that's in the Torah, but after a model that they saw all around them in the dominant culture as the way the elite would express their, their leisure. And that was the Roman Symposium, um, which is something that was around first in Greece, starting in around the fifth century BCE, I believe, from what I've read, um, and then making its way into Greco-Roman culture as well. Uh, and so the rabbis in the land of Israel, who are living under Roman occupation, see that the dominant culture, the and particularly the the aristocracy within that culture, have this special meal where. They, that's not for a particular holiday, but just like whenever one would want to do it at a dinner party, you invite over your friends, you have a multi-course meal, you have a lot of drinking, and you discuss philosophy and food and art and language and all sorts of heady topics, um, and maybe some not so heady ones as well. And uh, and you do that over the course of this extended meal. And so the rabbis said, "Hey, that's a great model. That's that's what freedom looks like." You know, and even though Jews living in the land of Israel at the time did not have, generally speaking, full freedom because they're living under Roman occupation. Um, but they said, you know what, we're going to adopt and adapt that model and we're going to make that into the Passover Seder without actually ever, you know, naming that it's modeled after the symposium. It was only in mid 20th century that some academic scholars noticed all the correlations mm -hmm. there and kind of put two and two together. Um, and so... So I think you, so where do you aim? Yeah, so I think that when going through the Seder, I think the the rituals and the structure uh, are really important and that those should be a springboard for getting to the ideas and the conversation. Um, he even says in the Shulchan Aruch, in a major codification of Jewish law from 16th century, um, that uh, the idea is really to have people asking questions and that, um, you know, if there are kids there, then they ask questions. If there's no kids, then adults ask each other. If you're doing a Seder all by yourself, no one else whatsoever, you should actually ask yourself questions. You can't just mm -hmm. read the Haggadah and call it a night. You have to ask questions. And that once people are asking questions, there's actually no need to say the four questions, the Manish Tana, because that's sort of just like, a sample of here are some questions you might ask. It's like a prompt if you don't have any other questions, you know, at the top of your mind. But if you come up with your own questions about what is this all about, or why are we doing this, or what's the meaning behind this ritual, or hmm, what do we make of this passage of the Torah, and it seems a little problematic, or whatever, um, that it, once you're asking questions, then you just can jump into it. That's that's part of fulfilling the mitzvah 
of telling the story and uh, and the particular aspect of the Seder called Magid, the telling. Uh, so, you know, like the structure, I think very much encourages and, and allows for that kind of spontaneity. And so it's like, you know what, and if you're doing that, you're good. Right. Um, like they should still do physical rituals, but in terms of the verbal ones, like that's what it's all about. So there was something you said a little uh, before this w in terms of how, how the rabbis looked at models of what freedom looks like and looked at the elites of the Roman culture in their occupation of the land. And I think to myself how much I, f I seem to see envy and aspiration in our culture f to be the Elon Musk, to be the, the Jeff Bezos, to be the super rich, to, to, to be able to inoculate ourselves from the miseries and sufferings and, uh, of daily life by being so wealthy and how, look, how in, in some ways we even end up with, I remember when, when Donald Trump was uh, coming to power and I was standing I think it was Yom Kippur. It, it, election hadn't happened just yet, but it look, looked like he might win. And somebody was, a woman was standing in the lobby of the synagogue and said, well, I mean, look, he's a, he's a billionaire. He must know something. He must be doing something right. And I thought, isn't that interesting how we, we aspire to that, that kind of elite life that, the idea is to become either Pharaoh or uh, a more benevolent version of that kind of aristocracy. Uh, and that and for some people that's considered freedom, freedom from daily struggle, right? If my mother always used to talk about if I win the lottery, if I was, and in those days, the lottery was the Irish sweepstakes. That was the only lottery that was around. There was no, Ontario Lottery Corporation, but it, it, it was if I win the lottery and then she would love to imagine how she would be free, free mm -hmm. to be able to do what she wants and be what she wants. So I wonder, you know, do we talk about those kinds of ideas in a Seder? Do we, do we, do we discuss false freedom, real freedom, right? I think we certainly should. Um, and I think notions of equality and equity are very much baked into some of the rituals and themes of the Seder. So, for example, in the Mishnah, the uh, early rabbinic work I referred to before from around 200 CE, it says that um, every Jew needs to be able to have four cups of wine. And if they can't afford it, then it has to be provided from the communal food collection. Um, and so like Seder has to be an experience of freedom for everyone. Doesn't mean you have to have the highest priced delicacies in the world or anything like that. But there, there are basics that, that aren't even just basics of survival that are basics, but that also represent, you know, some amount of leisure, like bread and roses too, right? To use an old union um, line um, uh, that, that give a person the opportunity to, to celebrate and, and with dignity. So um, I think, you know, if we, if we remember that when we're celebrating Pesach, and also when we say, let all who are hungry come and eat, um, like it's not supposed to be just about ourselves and trying to have an insular, wealthy existence, but, but rather it's, sure, we want to be free. Everyone should be free, but it's not, it's not a privilege we want to hoard. It's one that we want to spread. What's the, for you, what's the significance of, the empty chair, the Eliyahu idea, where does that fit into you? Okay, so um, the Kos Eliyahu or Elijah's cup um, uh, sort of has a, an interesting twisty history. Um, so in the, in the Talmud from the land of Israel, the Palestinian Talmud, um, there's an interpretation of the four cups as relating to four different verbs that are used in Exodus when God says, I will take you out, I will uh, redeem you, I will rescue you, and I will take you to be mine. Um, uh, and so the four cups are associated with those four verbs of liberation. 
And there's another verb that comes like right after that, that says, and I will bring you to the land um, and there will be your God. So the land referring to the land of Israel. So some folks then in response to this Talmudic text said, oh, well, we should have a fifth cup, right? And so in medieval ages, rabbis debated, should there be four cups or five cups? And generally speaking, the, the normative practice became to have four cups. Um, but in order to kind of uh, give some amount of representation to the position that there should be five cups, we have a fifth cup on the table that we don't drink. So it's there just sort of symbolically. And it's and it's was dubbed the Koseliahu, the cup of Elijah, because of the idea of Elijah representing the uh, Elijah as the the prophet who would be the harbinger of the messianic era, the time when there will be peace uh, throughout the world and plenty. No one would be hungry or want in any way. And so the idea of like, okay, we'll have this cup, and it's called the cup of Elijah, both because you know, oh, well, in the Messianic era, we'll find out, should we really have five cups or four cups? Like then all the questions will be solved. <laughs> um, sort of like the, the rabbinic Messianic era is like, you know, all the debates will get settled finally. Um, right. but, um, yeah. but it's also, I think, connected to the idea of like going to the land does not just mean literally going into the land of Israel, which already happened, um, you know, just after the Torah's narrative is, is over with the beginning of the book joshua um but it also represents the the ideal that we're you know we're not there yet right um and certainly at the time when that text in the torah is from they're not there yet by a long shot and so god is saying like i will take you i mean i will bring you into the land well so the cup of elijah i think is also representing like the worldly state that we need to aspire toward that we need to work toward um so you know, it's interesting. I was just reading something where we were talking about the mess messianic idea that it's not really about whether the Messiah is is something to look forward to. It's that the messianic era is here now. We're just not available to them. Hmm. We're just not open to the idea. We, like it, it's kind of the the idea of availability and presence in spiritual life. You know, even like before when we were talking about. <clears throat> that kind of non-dualism, that, that pantheism plus. Um, you know, in Zen, <clears throat> you look and there is a mountain. Mountain, no mountain, mountain. And that journey is that at first, the mountain seems separate from you. It is that thing over mm -hmm. there that you're looking at. And then you internalize the idea that everything is God, everything, there is nothing outside of it. It So this mountain and you are part of a unity of of a, a universal ecosystem that just is beyond your comprehension. So you, you, you accept and internalize uh, that, and then it becomes the mountain again, but this time it looks completely different to you. And I think sometimes with some of the pieces of the Exodus story, I, I tend to sort of do that, to sort of bounce back and forth between the separateness of things mm -hmm. and the unity of things. And then now I'm looking at it differently. You know, the outward journey to the promised land and the idea that th this moment is the promised land. But we keep thinking, no, no, it must just be over there. It's not here. It's, maybe it's over there. The last thing I wanted to talk about was the idea of a leap of faith. I'm going to jump in for one quick <laughs> Okay, go I for it. Bring up something else. <laughs> That's okay. Really, once we were on the topic of the cup of Elijah. Yeah. So given that, uh, I think it makes sense to see the cup of Elijah as this, I will still say aspirational. Mm -hmm. cup of the of a perfected world toward which we should all be working um because i while i hear you in terms of the idea of being present and the, you know that maybe we could see that we're already in a messianic era and we we just need to recognize it as such to me that that feels dangerous because then right. it's almost like we can rest on our laurels and not work to actually do the the work of improving the right. world there's no call to action in that right Right. Um, and I'd say the the more contemporary feminist Jewish custom of having a kos Miriam, a cup of Miriam on the table as well, filled with water because of the um, midrashic, the rabbinic interpretive associations between Miriam and a uh, well of water that would go with the Israelites in the wilderness, um, providing them with water to drink and everything. Um, 
in the Torah, uh, based on the fact that in the Torah, it's only right after Miriam dies that the Israelites start complaining they don't have water. So the rabbis say, well, why, why are they suddenly complaining about that now? Oh, it must be because Miriam just died. Uh, that she must have been the person whose merit uh, created this, you know, what they what they imagine as like a magical well that follows the Israelites around in the wilderness, mm. in the desert, right? Okay, so because of that midrashic rabbinic interpretive association between Miriam and water, so there's this contemporary feminist Jewish custom of having a cup of water um, sort of in parallel to the cup of wine for Elijah. And I think even the move of having that cup of water and calling it Miriam's cup um, is part of that stepping toward a more redeemed uh, existence. Mm. So you don't like the idea of just thinking it's all here. You were just not paying attention because then we, we have no call to action. We have no ability to move forward and say, this is an imperfect world and we need to keep striving to not so much become perfect, but to make it better. Yeah. Yeah. So let me, um, yeah, so and, I, and within Kabbalah, yeah. within Jewish mysticism. So although there's a lot of similarities to what you were saying about um, uh, Zen Buddhism, um, maybe maybe a difference is that while within Kabbalah, like like with the example of Freud Moshe Cordovero, who I cited before, um, yes, there is this idea that everything is God. And at the same time, the world in which we live is fractured, it's broken, and God is not fully unified because our world is not fully unified. And mm -hmm. so the, like the, we phrase are in disharmony. Alone, we are in disharmony. Yeah. 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 And like the phrase tikkun olam, repairing the world. Um, I mean, originally it comes from the Mishnah actually, where it's talking about various uh, legislative enactments that rabbis made in order to correct injustices in society. Um, and, um, having to do with like poverty relief and and other like real just interpersonal human kind of stuff um and then it gets re-understood by medieval jewish mystics as being not just about oh we need to do things to fix society but also in so doing we are also sort of repairing the fractures of god because if our world is fractured then god is fractured too because the god and mm. god in the world are not exactly coterminous but are largely overlapping um, yeah. <clears throat> so. and, and i've always little i was speaking with a, a rabbi in the states rabbi liebling who's an activist and interesting guy um and we were doing a chat together and you know he was saying look you can't you can think that your job is to repair the world to tikkun olam but if you don't do tikkun hanefesh and repairing your own soul then you'll just be that one who's angry and spitting and hitting people with your sign because they're not doing what you think is the best way to go through the world. So we have that kind of internal work to make the external work worth doing in a way that is worthy of the enterprise as opposed to in a self-righteous way that doesn't hear or listen for anything. One, one more yeah, thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. One more thing. I, actually says, uh, first comes repair of the self and then repair of the world. Right, right. So one one thing I always was kind of interested in, and tell me if I've got the story wrong, but they're at the uh, the Red Sea and Yul Brenner's coming, you know. I mean, he, he's on the chariot and he's decided to, to, you know what? No, I don't think I'll let them go. I think I'll kill them now. And they're all uh, freaking out because now they feel like, great, you brought us out here. This is the beginning of their whining. Uh, great, you brought us out here, and now you're going to get us all killed. I mean, at least there we weren't going to all get killed at the same time. And Moses is really praying about it. And then basically the idea is, you know, the God answer is, what are you praying to me for? Look at that guy. And there's Nachshon, who, and this is the part I, I, I may be wrong about, but I hope I'm not because I love it, is, is he, he either walked into the water or was pushed into the water. And no, I always, walk. yeah, but for me, I'd love the idea of either pushed or walked. Who cares? One way, sometimes you need a push and sometimes you walk. But either way, he just keeps walking and just keeps walking. And it's a, that is the leap of faith. So where right, is. Whereas Hesha would call it, it's a leap of action. Right. So where is the leap of, of, of action that you hope people come to at the end of a Passover Seder? That's a great question. Um, 
I'd say that I, I hope that through the experience of celebrating the Seder and going through the rituals and asking lots of questions and thinking about what are the implications of all this for the real world that we come out inspired and energized, not just to try to pursue our own freedom, whether personally or communally, but also others as well. And that we realize that we're all bound up in this together. And um, uh, that's, that's part of what um, Passover is about. And why, for example, in the Torah, when it talks about um, both Shabbat and holidays, um, it, you know, it says you should celebrate them, you and your family and your male and female servants and the stranger who is in your gates, right? That it, it's supposed to be an expansive freedom um, mm -hmm. and celebration. It's not just supposed to be reserved for just the, you know, just this group of people or just this gender or just this age. Um, so, I think that that's a, a really key message that I hope people come out of the experience of, of the Pesach Seder with. That so that's, a, that's an interesting one because you, you, all, you also end up in a situation where, so this brings me to the last piece of the chosen people. So I often found through my life that people who use that are really basically saying there's a VIP lounge and we're allowed in it and the rest of you aren't because we are chosen. When someone tells you, talks to you about the chosen people, how do you respond to that idea? Yeah, so I think an interesting thing in Judaism is this tension between the idea of an omnivchar, a chosen nation, and um, the thing that, that really runs through so much of Jewish texts and ideas, which is that we don't think everyone in the world needs to be Jewish, right? We are not a universalizing religion, right? We don't go out and try to convert everybody and say, you know, you'll only be a good person or you'll only have a relationship with God or you'll only have a place in the world to come even, you know, if you're Jewish. No, we don't say that. Um, and uh, and in fact, there are, there are texts that talk about, you know, non-Jews have a place in the world to come, et cetera. Um, you know, that, the idea that, that all people can have an eternal soul um, all people can be good. All people can have a relationship with God. You don't have to be Jewish for that, right? So chosenness cannot mean that we're the only ones who have those privileges or something, um, you know, in a, in a monopolistic kind of way. That can't be what it means. So I think what it actually means, and, and I'm certainly not the first one to say this by any means, is the idea that we understand that we as the Jewish people were chosen by God to receive the Torah and therefore to be obligated to the mitzvot, to the commandments or the responsibilities entailed therein. Um, and it's, it's not, it's, it's a chosenness of responsibility, not of privilege. Um, and it, it means that we have a role to play in the redemption of the world. And for us through, for our people, for our religion and our, our cultures, that is through the, the path of of the Torah um, and so for other so for other religions were they chosen to take that path is that the idea so that if you know the the idea of prophets and messengers right and the Baha'is believe that the, it's like the Muslims believe that you know there there is the Abraham you know there is this idea of Jesus then there is Muhammad uh, and uh, it, in Baha'i's terms, there's the Baha'u'llah, which is their version, of, you know, in the 1850s and on. Um, is it that at different times, different messages go to different groups, but they're all the same message? Um, I don't necessarily want to say that. A, for one, I don't, I don't feel like I can speak definitively about other religions because, mm -hmm. well, you know, I've studied some to a certain extent, like I don't feel steeped in them or expert in them. Um, uh, but, and, and I think there maybe also is, is a bit of like, I don't know, presumptuousness to, to say like, as a Jew that I think, you know, your, your religion is this and your religion is that. But, um, I do think that within the, the traditional Jewish structure of the Shavu Mitzvah Ben Noach, the seven Noahide laws, um, 
is this a basic idea that like anybody who basically is a decent moral human being and has a conception of God, um, and particularly if it's, if it's a unified conception of God, which even religions that have multiple uh, demigods, like let's say Hinduism, but they, they still kind of all connect back to one God. Um, uh, so that though all of those religions then are considered to be um, like, okay for those people from even a traditional halakhic or Jewish legal framework. Right. Um, and um, and that's they why don't, like, they don't seem to have that like, chosen. Them or anything. But they don't mm-hmm. seem to have that chosen narrative that, that runs through Judaism. You see, I always worry about it in, in Judaism because of uh, it can breed an exceptionalism that, that I've, I've heard through my yeah. life. You know, I remember being at a Shabbat at somebody's house once and a woman was talking about how wonderful Jews are and how, you know, the Nobel prizes and all this stuff. And I said, are, are, are you actually saying that we're better than other people? And she didn't even pause. And she went, yes. And I thought, I, I can't help. I, I, my, my wife was looking at me like, please don't make a fuss right now. <laughs> and I just said, I, I, why are we doing this together? Why, like, this isn't Shabbat. Like, you're you're actually telling me you're better than other people. And see, I don't understand why we're sitting here together. You're missing the point. But it can happen when you grow up with your, we are the chosen people. So I, I just sort of find it to be sometimes a bit of a poison pill. Sure. And I think that that is especially dangerous if people's associations or attachments to Judaism are more cultural Mm-hmm. Than, than let's say spiritual, yeah, right, right. Because then they're like, oh, I'm a member of the tribe. That that in and of itself, yeah, yeah, makes yeah. It special. I, I, um, I do something in the workshop. Like, no, that's you know, like Jewish tribalism or Jewish culture. From my perspective, is just like an epiphenomenon of Jewish religion, right? right Judaism right. is what's at the core, and the various cultural yeah, things yeah. grow up around it in different places at different times. Um, in different ways. I, I, so, I, I freak yeah. people out sometimes in workshops when I say, God isn't Jewish, we're Jewish. Yeah. And they're like, one woman came back two weeks later and just, I can't get this out of my head. That just can't be true. I said, <laughs> of course it's true. This is just our particular way of getting there. If you've been born in a, into a Muslim family, that would have been your particular way of getting there. It's it's not that there's one way, you know, it's Matthew Fox writes about it all the time. One river, many wells, right? right. Or Rabbi Menachem Hamiiri, who was a 15th century rabbi in Provence in, in southern France. Um, he writes about um, the nations that are bounded by the ways of religion, um, which is which hmm. the long winded way of saying basically like, other people who have their paths right. um, and that he goes on to say that those are not considered avodah zarat, they're not considered idolatry um, even if on the face of it they might look like what would classically be termed idolatry within traditional jewish discourse um, because he's saying like hey if they have an ethical system and a spiritual system then then right, they're, right. they're they're not idolatry all right, so how do people find you if they want to find your congregation and more stuff about what you do? Because you're very active in terms of not just a, a service every once in a while, but you've got whole curriculums going. So how do people find you if they want to find you? Sure, yeah. Um, so everyone's welcome to check us out, Macomb Creative Downtown Judaism. Our website is macombto.org. So M-A-K-O-M-T-O, as in short for Toronto, dot O-R-G. Um, or you can give us a holler at 416-546-6043 or drop us a line at info at macombto.org. Um, and happy to welcome anybody to our services or our adult education classes. We have um, educational programs and classes for kids and for teens as well. We have um, meditation sits twice a week. Uh, we host art and music. And uh, basically, things that fall under the rubric of spirituality, learning, and culture. So everyone is welcome to check us out. Beautiful, and, beautiful. Uh, well, listen, so- Rabbi, um, hug Pesach Sameach. Um, 
I hope you have a, a wonderful Seder or two and uh, that uh, people get something out of what we've spoken about today in terms of adding to the value of what can become rote uh, and finding ways to revitalize it. So thank you for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. Amen. And as I like to say, Chag Chirut Sameach. So ah. happy festival of freedom. Um, Beautiful. The calls. Rather, the, the prayer is called Pasach Zaman Chirutenu, the time of our freedom. So hope everyone has a really joyous and liberating Pasach. Rabbi Aaron Le Levy, say it right, folks, uh, a spiritual leader of Mokom Downtown Creative Jewish uh, Judaism. Uh, I'm Ralph Benmergi. This is Not That Kind of Rabbi. If you want to get in touch with me, just go to Ralph Benmergi. I know it's a little weird to write it, but Google it and they'll correct it for you. But ralphbenmergi.ca and you can find, uh, I do spiritual counseling uh, as well. And uh, my book is called, I Thought He Was Dead. And uh, the podcast that I do, you hope it's Phil, and this one happened to be on there. And if you're a jazz listener, Jazz FM has my uh, podcast, The Torch, once a month. Take care of each other and be good to each other. And if for Easter and for Passover, uh, uh, may you have a, a wonderful time together as family and uh, flourish in your own freedom. Bye. Mm -hmm.